the first thing to say about it is money laundering and fraud is a massive, massive problem. It's uh, it sometimes, sometimes surprises people, it's obviously, because it's illegal. It's difficult to get a, a proper estimate of how much uh, is, is lost to the economy through th those activities. But the figure that I use is about £350 billion pounds a year lost to the economy through money laundering and fraud. And that's about 15% of GDP. So it's a great big chunk, and you can see it just it's a lot of crime. It's uh, the impact it has on public services, loss of taxation, all that sort of stuff. There's massive, massive repercussions, and that's mainly made up. With, uh, the the National Crime Agency reckons there's about a hundred billion in money laundering. I think that's a very conservative figure. I you know I would have no problem doubling it, and fraud is now the fastest growing crime. Um, it's about 40, it's over 40% of crime. It affects, a lot of people are fraud, uh, you know, are victims of fraud, but don't report it. But if you just look at reported fraud, it's the biggest crime. It affects one in 11 adults. And the latest figure we've got for that is around about um, 200 billion. It's about 200 billion is, is lost to the economy through fraud. Uh, and it's everything from, you know, the, the little thing that might happen to you online to, of course, massive fraud. And, and behind all this money laundering and fraud, you've got, you know, drug smugglers, people smugglers. You've got wicked, wicked, wicked uh, people. There's a lot of fraud uh, goes on in the public sector. The, so during COVID, for example, uh, there were big grants given out to businesses to keep them going. The It was called the Business Bounce Back Loan Scheme. And um, about £47 billion pounds was allocated by government to save businesses during that period. And it is reckoned that £11 billion, that's a heck of a lot, that's nearly that's, uh, uh, over 20%, between 20 25%, £11 billion, uh, went in fraud and error. And HMRC, um, the tax office, who are the body responsible for, uh, were responsible for allocating it now and allocating it at the time, and are now responsible for trying to ensure that we get back the money that was fraudulently claimed, have already written off four billion of it. Just to put all that into context, um, uh, the total budget, you know, the total budget of. Um, uh, uh, education, for example, um, is about 100 billion, just over 100 billion. So if you're losing 350 billion pounds a year through, through um, uh, money laundering and fraud, you're losing three times the education budget or you're losing two times the health budget. We're talking about mega, mega, mega bucks. And whenever you talk about it, the poorest countries always lose the most because it's a global phenomenon. It's not companies just in the UK. It's, it's uh, not bad, bad actors just in the UK, it's bad actors over the world. And the UN estimates that $90 billion leaves Africa every year as a result of dirty money, illicit wealth, 90 billion. And if you put that, just to get an idea of the magnitude of that, the world's annual food programme, the World Food Programme, the annual program is 40 billion. So this is more than double the annual food program that is lost annually as a result of dirty money floating around the, uh, uh, the global economy. Um, the interest, sad thing, tragically, this whole issue about dirty money really um, was ignited in the pub public interest, in the public domain, out of Ukraine. Because when the war started in Ukraine, uh, suddenly uh, people became alive to the issue of Russian oligarchs and the way that they uh, were stealing from their country and then um, moving their money uh, illicitly across uh, uh, across uh, borders. Um, so it was it's tragic that that happened. But those of us that have been campaigning on these issues for ever and ever have grasped the opportunity. And it's not just, I mean, People talk about Russia and the kleptocrats in Russia, and there are incredibly wealthy people who, when when the USSR, when the Soviet Union dis was dis disintegrated, they at that time point picked up an enormous amount of 
you know, national assets, state assets, and uh, for a song, and then sold them on and made made their fortune wrong in that way. And then there's always corrupt contracts about servicing various um, national uh, facilities, you know, either in the energy sector or in the infrastructure, um, transport infrastructure in, uh, sector. But it isn't just them. There's also terrible people in the country like Kazakhstan, which is an ex-Soviet Union country. Um, there, just in that one country, 160 individuals in a country, I think it's about 10, 12 million is the population, 160 own over half of the total nation, national wealth. And that's really because they've stolen a lot of the national infrastructure assets that were in government hands before the dissolution of the USSR and used those. Um, the problem we've got in the UK is that we are the jurisdiction of choice for dirty money. Um, and Britain built its financial services sector, which is one of the most, the healthiest and most, most fast growing parts of the UK economy on the back of being a trusted jurisdiction. People trusted us. You know, we were seen to be governed by the rule of law. That reputation of trust is being massively undermined by people talking about London grad, you might have read in the papers, and London being seen as uh, the one of the one of the uh, uh, centers for uh, illicit wealth across the, the globe. And that's beginning to be reflected now in various indices. So the Moody's index, which measures the sort of um, uh, stability and reliability of, of economies, we're on the downward trajectory. And then Transparency International also do an index, and we're certainly going down that um, uh, that trajectory as well. And uh, the view that I take and the people of my all-party group that is lobbying around issues of corruption, dirty money and responsible taxation is that Britain can never get sustained good economic growth on the back of dirty money. In the end, the dirty, the good money will leave you if you if you only attract the dirty. So it's in it's not it's in the interest of the economy as a whole that we actually bear down on illicit wealth in in, uh, in Britain and and have us you know move to an, a zero tolerance um, a culture of uh, illicit finance and dirty money in the UK. The reason we've got here is I never blame a political party. It did start with Margaret Thatcher and her a big bang in the 80s, which you guys might have learned about in your economics, I hope. Um, uh, and um, at that time, interestingly, the character is still around at the moment, um, Lord David Willits. At that time, he was an advisor to Mrs. Thatcher in number 10. And he said, if you really let the financial services go in the way that she did, total deregulation, you really let that happen you will um, encourage um, uh, fraud and unethical behaviour. There are quotes of him saying that around the place. So he was actually quite far-sighted. He now appears uh, as a guru and runs a, he chairs a very good think tank called the Resolution Foundation. So Mrs. T started all with Big Bang, but under both um, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, under the Labour government, we continued to deregulate to encourage foreign capital into the country uh, and to encourage the growth of the financial services sector. So I always say both governments of both colours were responsible for allowing that massive deregulation of our um, economy, which made, which made us an attractive location for dirty money. And we also have our relationship with um, our tax havens, these are all the overseas territories and crown dependencies, which again, which are places like the, the most infamous is the British Virgin Isles. Uh, but um, the crown dependencies, um, Jersey and Guernsey and that lot are just an Isle of Man, are just as bad as some of those um, Caribbean islands that are part that are known as the tax haven islands. Um, our relationship with those makes is another reason. So we've got the deregulation coupled with our relationship with those tax havens that makes us a, a, a jurisdiction of choice. And we, we learn more and more about the dirty money through the leaks. There have been a series of um, uh, 
uh, incredible leaks where the people working for law firms or accountancy firms have leaked you know millions of, of documents one and one and one of the most famous early ones was the Panama Papers which came out of a, um, a, a law firm I think Mossack um, Fonseca I think it was but anyway what is interesting is that leak talked about um, over 200,000 corporate entities that were involved in secrecy in one way or another not all for bad but most of them for nefarious purposes and over 50 percent of the entities that were cited in the Panama Papers were registered in the British Virgin Isles that demonstrates the close relationship between our tax havens and similarly there's another leak from America known as the FinCEN leaks that's the American agency that oversees anti-money laundering reg um, regulations in America and again, they, there was a leak of documents that were submitted to them from banks as to suspicious uh, reports of, uh, of uh, uh, transactions in banks. And over 20 percent, over 20 percent of the uh, documents from the banks to the agency were BVI, British Virgin Islands, re re registered. So that's why we are where we are. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit because nobody really understands how money laundering happens you can set up a company in the UK in a couple of hours and it costs you 12 quid uh, and nobody checks that the information that you give um, is uh, correct or not so you know we for example one we know five you, you're supposed to say who the owner of the company is named beneficial owner you're supposed to, when you register your company, say, you know, I'm Margaret Hodge Limited and Margaret Hodge is the beneficial owner. Um, quite a lot of people don't say who the beneficial owner is, and when they do, they lie about it. So for, uh, we, we know that there are five beneficial, so-called beneficial owners who own 6,000 companies on our, between them. So these are probably people who help set up companies, put their names in that have nothing to do with the company at all, except they probably made a little bit of money out of setting up the company for 12 quid. We have a Belgian-based doctor who uh, emerged in one of the leaks in, uh, as, as being the beneficial owner of thousands of companies. We've got a lawyer in Latvia who did a deal with a 24-year-old who had an address in Potter's Bar, and thousands of companies were registered to this address in this this 24-year-old sort of presumably student trying to make a bob or two to pay his tuition fees. Um, he was put down as the owner. And the funniest I came across was a two-year-old who uh, she was the beneficial owner of a few companies. And it turned out she'd been really busy because she managed to get herself married by the age of two. And she was registered as Mrs. Blah, 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 blah. So we have this very lax regulatory regime of setting up companies. So the best example I give is, is there was a, there's a, a Swedish, Danish bank, Danish bank called the Danske Bank. And they had a, they had a branch in Estonia. And that was used to take a lot of the money out of Russia. And the way it worked was you'd set up a company, M. Hodge Limited, run by M. Hodge, and you'd open a, uh, 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 an account for that company in the Estonian branch of the Danske Bank. And then you'd set up a phony invoice between that bank and the Russian trying to get his money out of uh, Russia for some sort of services. So that would get the money out on the back of a phony, in, in, um, phony invoice to this shell company registered in the UK uh, uh, in, in, in Estonia. Then you'd set up another company in another maybe Cyprus or somewhere, and you'd set up another phony invoice between those two companies. There's the Danske branch of M. Hodge to John Smith Incorporated in Cyprus, and that would get the money out of Latvia into Cyprus. And you'd go on doing that from country to country until the origins of the money got lost. So you can see how it's called money laundering, because it literally gets round, round the globe in that way. And then you'd end up buying a 50 million pound house in 
Park Lane, probably from the part of the Duchy of Cornwall estate or something like that. And that would bring your Ill illegitimate money into the legitimate system so that you can enjoy the uh, impact of your nefarious activities. That's how it that's how it works. And for me, I'm going to give you I, lots of people come and tell me about their stories. So I get lots of people coming up to me and telling me, tell me when you want me to shut up if I'm going on too long. But lot, uh, uh, am I OK to carry on? Yep. Lots of people uh, tell me about the stories. And the most egregious example I had was that there was a terrible explosion in a warehouse in the port in Lebanon, probably some three or four years ago now. And over 200 people were killed. Billions was lost in terms of property damage. And thousands of people were, were injured. And uh, about a year after it happened, six months or a year after it happened, I get a phone call from a journalist from Reuters saying, you'll never guess, Margaret, the company that owned the warehouse, the, that, that, that the warehouse was a British registered company. And it, it, they purported to have fertilizer in there, which they were um, taking to Mozambique to be used as fertilizer. So I did my usual comment about lax regulatory framework of Britain allowing this to happen and didn't think twice about it. And then about three weeks after I gave my quote, which must have appeared all over the place, I get about five or six phone calls from the Lebanon, from the Bar Association in the Lebanon, from various investigative journalists in the Lebanon, the national radio, people like that, who are all trying to find out who was responsible for this explosion, which had caused such devastation in the Lebanon. They which cut a long story so short, it ended up that the real owner of that fertilizer was three Ukrainian kleptocrats. This was before the war in Ukraine that the fertilizer was not going to help um, the soil in Mozambique. It went on to Assad in um, Syria, and he was using it to for barrel bombs to um, uh, kill his own population in the Syrian war. And that just shows how a lax um, uh, regulatory framework can be abused not just to launder money, but to create things like that. Um, I, I'm quickly just to can tell you there are four things that we, we should be doing that would help us, which is what I campaign on. We need to toughen up our regulation so you can't lie about who owns a company. And the government are doing that in a half-hearted way in an economic crime bill that it's finding its way through Parliament. And my little organization is working very hard to improve that legislation. We need to more importantly have smart regulation to stop um, all these all these schemes that are used that enable you to launder money aren't devised by the Russian kleptocrat or the drug smuggler or the people smuggler. They're devised by accountants, lawyers, bankers, those sort of people who we call the enablers who set up the schemes, which they then sell to these bad actors. So we think you have got to make the people who are responsible for devising the schemes accountable for what they do. And we're trying to introduce into this legislation um, a new criminal offense, which would impact on all the enablers if they fail to prevent fraud and money laundering. So they would be prosecuted if they failed to prevent fraud and money laundering. And we're building that on the experience that we've had in the UK around uh, health and safety. So over a generation ago, uh, if, you were, if you went onto a building site, lots of people died and were injured on the building site. And we reformed health and safety legislation to put a duty on the companies and their owners to uh, prevent accidents, at, uh, they, there was a new failure to prevent accidents on their, on their building sites. And overnight, that cut the number of accidents by about 94%. So it's not that we want to lock up all these accountants. We want to use the law to change behavior as a tool to change behavior. So we want smart regulation. 
We want tough enforcement. So even where we have our laws, uh, we are completely useless, particularly in comparison to the USA at, um, in, uh, at, at pursuing the wrongdoers. So the Americans see all this as a national security threat and have increased their budget on um, enforcement by over 30%. We have cut the amount of money we give to the various enforcement agencies by 4%. So we're saying, our, my little group are saying, if it only costs you 12 quid to set up a company, you can in increase that very, very easily. It costs you a thousand pounds to set up a company in BVI. It costs you 425 pounds to set up a company in Jersey. It costs you, and this is my real I would say it costs you £12 to set up a company. It costs you £1,200 to get a visa for a skilled worker. I mean, it's completely crackers. So it's a, um, a, thousand, a thousand times, a hundred times more to get that than it is to uh, set up a company. So you could increase the fee for setting up a company. It wouldn't be put people off and you could use that money, ring fence it to uh, strengthen your enforcement. Then the other thing, so one is smart regulation, two is tough enforcement, three is transparency. The more you, more visible things are, uh, more you can follow the money and see where money's going wrong. And we're very bad at that in the UK. For example, you, there are a lot of people who buy property in the UK with their dirty money. And we introduced legislation which said, if you're a foreign company buying property here in the UK, you have to say who the beneficial owner of that property, of that company is. Again, people have found loopholes in that badly crafted legislation by the government. And there are still 52,000 um, homes here in the UK owned by people, probably through di with dirty money, where we have no idea who the owner is, partly because the legislation is badly written, partly because people then set up trusts. And so you say, you know, the Hodge Trust without knowing behind it is Margaret Hodge, that wicked woman. You know, so you want much, as much transparency as you can. And the same goes with sanctions at, and you then want accountability. And at the moment, the government is very secretive about how it pursues dirty money. And we want to open that through public account, through parliament, to the NGO sector and to journalists and all those people who um, make it their business to try and find out dirty money. There we are, I shall stop with that. Excellent, thank you very much, Margaret, I appreciate that. Um, just as a bit of a warning, we've got some drilling just next door in case uh, you hear any noises in the background. Um, but I think it's useful to go to the Q&A section now. So if you do have any questions, so you feel free to type them into the section and I'll, I'll just manage those as, as they come in. Um, as we're getting questions coming in, I guess I'll, I'll start off. And then you talked about the issue that this, it's obviously not just UK based, it's happening in so many different countries around the world. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts were on how we can better coordinate um, our kind of our efforts to combat economic crime. Globally? Yes. Well, it's really difficult. I mean, we've tried that on, you know, tax avoidance. You know, people now create create financial structures that have no other purpose than to avoid tax in the, jur in the jurisdiction where they have their economic activity and their profits. And the OECD has been trying since 1980 or there, even probably earlier, to reform international conventions and rules. So that people, uh, so that you do pay tax where you make your money, and so far they've not really succeeded at all in that. So my view on that is twofold. One is you, to, we, I work very closely with the Americans, the, the Canadians, the Australians, and the Europeans. These are the big economies. So if you can get some agreement across those economies, that's one way of doing it. And the other thing I always say is. Actually, the more it's a bit like fighting malaria. If it's a worldwide problem, you can either say, oh, it's so impossible, we've got the whole world to stop malaria, or you tackle it country by country. And in that way, it becomes more concentrated in the remaining countries, and then it's easier to attack. So I think Britain should set go but work by example, try and get the big economies working together, but not use the fact that it's a global problem as an excuse for inaction today. Great, thank you. 
Um, we've got a question that's come in here. And have you read Moneyland by Oliver Barra? Yeah. Um, and if so, um, are the problems that he highlights still current today? Or yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> He's written another book. What the Butler saw, or something like that. Butler to the world. What? Butler to the world. Butler to the world, which is also very good, and he's apparently writing a third book, so it hasn't changed. It's a good book. They're all good reads. They're all good reads. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, and another one here. Um, what do you mean by the term zero tolerance in respect to this serious problem? So what they say. Well, I think I mean what I said to you. My my solutions were. I think we need smart regulation i don't want to over regulate it you then need really tough enforcement if i give you an example the danska bank example that i talked about the americans have who are much better at this than us have just uh come to a deal a pre-court settlement with the danska bank um over criminal activity where they find them two billion dollars and because the Americans have got a ring fencing settlement, that two billion dollars will go back into fighting dirty money. We've got nothing when if we, we do nothing, we get peanuts in comparison to what the Americans get. And then any money we do go goes to the Treasury rather than back into fighting dirty crime. So zero tolerance means what it says, that you don't tolerate any of it. You, I, I mean, my one of my views with the government at the moment is that I think they're frightened of tackling it, uh, partly because the financial service sector is very influential in the political world at the moment, uh, you know, and therefore they just lobby like hell against it. They're making loads of money out of these bad actors and they want they don't want to stop. And also partly post Brexit. They don't want to when the economy is already, you know, there's been an impact on the economy from exiting Europe. They don't want to add to that by make, doing any challenge to the financial services sector, which my answer is you'll never have sustained wealth on the back of dirty money. Okay, yeah, I completely understand. Fair enough. I guess uh, kind of linking into some of the things that you mentioned before as well, you mentioned the fact that we had the regulation on the factor, and we had that kind of theme continued under New Labour as well. You're going very soft, I'm afraid. Sorry, sorry. Um, oh, that's it. Uh, considering some of the things you mentioned in when when you spoke, in that we had the regulation on Margaret Thatcher, and we had that kind of idea progressed um, and during the time of New Labour as well. Do we, is it the case that there isn't any political will from this current government, or do you see that problem still occurring in the future? Were the government to change at the next election or in the next few years? Well? Oh, well, I hope that Labour government would tackle it like mad. And at the moment, the very really interesting thing is I'm working, because it's the only way to get anything through, I'm working on a very strong cross-party alliance. And on the back benches, there is a, un, you know, there's massive unanimity. We may disagree about everything from Brexit to immigration to woke, anti-woke stuff. There may be agreement on all these issues, disagreement on all these issues, but on fighting dirty money, there's pretty solid agreement, which I think comes in comes in the wake of uh, Ukraine, particularly, which, you know, when, the, when we've exposed the Russians as being sort of at the heart of um, laundering money between jurisdictions. Okay. So I and I'm sure that well I you know I can't talk to them but I think the Labour government would would act much more strongly than this long. <laughs> okay, um, and we've got a question here from Tom that kind of ties in with all of that as well. How much do you think that the issue is tied in with dirty money that's flowing through politics? I a lot. Good question. Um, and. Um, uh, uh, I, I think what is so awful about dirty money is that it is infecting the public space and it is infecting our politics. We know, for example, that um, uh, probably, I mean, somebody said to me, I probably have underestimated, at least four million pounds has come from the Russians into the Conservative Party. But we also know on the Labour Party side that one of our people took half a million quid from the Chinese. So it isn't just Russian money. And it's not just one party again. It's it's right across politics. I think it's in. I think it's infecting it terribly. We've got to, have, you know, much again. What's the answer? Tough regulation, proper enforcement, 
uh, transparency as you as much as you can and proper accountability. Those are always my four pillars of action. And you can think about specifics under those four pillars. I think it works quite well. Okay. And kind of moving kind of into that even further, um, the question here, how, do you think that uh, the idea of regulatory capture actually comes into it? Regulatory capture by? So they've asked how much of a problem is regulatory capture when it comes to, to money laundering? Do you think it's, do you think that regulatory, regulatory capture? I don't understand what we mean by regulatory capture in that context. Sorry, I'm being a bit. I, I think I am, and please, um, Benedict, tell me if I'm incorrect. So I understand it to mean, as we're talking about money flowing through politics and some dirty money flowing through politics, whether that extends as far as regulatory capture, or are we just saying. You that... mean that, that you mean people buy influence? Uh, essentially, yeah. Yeah, that's outright, yeah. The answer is yes. And Boris Johnson was the best example of it, you know. <laughs> terrible. It's terrible. And we should get rid of it too. Absolutely supporting. It infects and diminishes politics in the most awful way. Um, I just... mean, we we spend our life talking about corruption in developing countries. We should sort our own house out and not go around being arrogant about other other less developed um, democracies and I... economies. I completely agree with you on that, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, a question here that I've missed from earlier. Why has the situation been allowed to reach this sorry state of affairs? I think the, the answer is what I said before. The financial services sector is a really important part of the, the economy. And people, you know, the growth, you know, support the growth of that sector, supported jobs and you know, wealth creation and therefore money for public services. Uh, uh, so people have been panicky about touching it, particularly in the context of Brexit. And I think the other thing is the closeness. It's not just Russian oligarchs who put money into politics. It's the big four are all over politics. For example, the accountants are all over politics. And so I think the influence of the financial services sector on public policy making is um, uh you know not right it's a bad thing um and another question here so i, I believe they're linking the idea of the war on drugs to some of the issues that we've talked about um so essentially they're asking if war on drugs ended do you think that would help some of the issues that we've talked about well if you stop making stuff illegal um there wouldn't be an incentive but there's too much dirty money of which Drug smuggling is just one element. There's a lot of bad, bad, bad people in the world, too many. So obviously, if you stop making something illegal, it ceases to be an element in the illegality in, of that in that domain. But I don't think that would be the answer, really, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if anybody else does have any other questions, do, do keep them coming through. I'll I'll go through one of mine in the meantime. Um, is is there any role for kind of the, the smaller businesses and individuals to an extent, possibly in helping to combat these ideas of economic crime that we talked about? Well, they're they're not guiltless. Quite often, when you look at who helps setting up these companies, you know, they're called companies that group of professionals are called company service providers. They are small businesses in obscure places that do it. So they are estate agents is another little group, you have probably put in the SME sector, um, who are use um, dirty money to, you know, sell properties. So um, I don't think small businesses are just part of the private sector. Uh, I mean, the banks are naughty too. I mean, the banks make money out of dirty money, and they don't. They don't. Uh, they're not vigilant enough in in taking it out. Um, whistleblowers, which is where we get most of our information about it, get appallingly treated um, by uh, after they've blown the whistle. And however much you try and protect them through law, um, it very rarely is effective in the actual workplace. I you know, rarely see anybody going back to their jobs after they've blown the whistle on the organisation they work with. 
Um, so um, I don't think it's, I don't think this is an SME versus big corporations. It's just business. And there's another question here that links directly to what you've you've mentioned there. Actually, do you think we could create stronger incentives, um, financial incentives for those whistleblowers from within those organisations that are facilitating money laundering? Yeah, there are people who talk about that in America. You get a sort of you know percentage or something of what you help to recover. Um, I've, got, I've got mixed feelings on that. There's a pro and con, you know. Um, I think we shouldn't encourage, you know, because you do not all whistleblowers are genuine. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, if you put in a financial incentive, that might incentivize a bit of bad behavior among whistleblowers. But equally, others are, I mean, I just feel torn on that one. I haven't got a, you know, clear, clear, you know, view on it. I think you can go either way on the argument. I would love to see better support for whistleblowers, and I find that very difficult to conceptualise. There's a move in Parliament to set up an office for whistleblowers, which I think would have a marginal impact, because you're always down to up. But however well, once you've blown the whistle on the organisation, and assume you get it rid of it, it helps you eradicate that corruption from the organization. You've got to go back and sit in the desk opposite the people who you've uh, blown the whistle on. And I think it's just impossible to reintegrate yourself in that situation. It's really difficult. Okay. Yeah, I'll get into it. Um, okay, moving on then. So, do you, what's your perspective on the role of digital currencies uh, within economic crime? Um, do you think that tighter regulation is needed? Do you think there that... isn't any? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the, I'm not the world's best person on crypto. I'm afraid. I, I'm, I find it difficult to quite conceptualise, but I am sure it's where we should be. When I talk to some of the crypto agencies, they tell me that it's all much more transparent with crypto than it is with banks. But you know, I I just wouldn't pretend to be a, an expert on it. I just don't. I find it a bit difficult to get my head round. <laughs> no, no worries at all. <laughs> all right. Um, in that case, what what do you think is the best way to go about educating the public about the implications of economic crime? Well. You know, we we work very hard at that. It's really hard to get, you know, I mean, Rus the the Russian element in Ukraine. We have really, you know, tried to keep. We do all these exposes on these on these um, kleptocrats. All worth ten, twelve billion pounds. They're worth a lot of money. Some of these people. Uh, so we try and show that. We try and get coverage. You like the story I told you about the Lebanon. Although I think there's various people frightened of publishing that in case they get uh, a defamation um, uh, action against them. So, uh, and also to try and demystify it. People think of all this, it is a bit nerdy, but what you've got to do is to demystify it and say, look, you know, this is double the, double the health, uh, the uh, health budget, triple the education budget. You know, try and do it, try and sort of put it into the, a context where people, this is something that they should be interested in. It's not just for the um, uh, experts who understand the language, it's for all of us. Great, thank you. Um, okay, just again, if anybody else has any further questions, I'm probably got a couple more questions. So feel free to jot any down um, and then I'll ask these. I guess mine can be asked together, really. So, on the one hand, um, looking on a slightly more positive note, I think, what progress do you think has been made um, in the last, in, in recent years, in terms of fighting economic crime? And I guess at the same time, because they're probably quite linked. Uh, would you be able to tell us a bit more about some of the work that the all-party parliamentary group on anti-corruption and um, responsible tax is currently engaged in? Well, we've got, we've had two, we're in the middle of a second bill, so the, taking the two together, there was one bill that attempted to deal with this issue of uh, properties in the UK owned by foreign companies, and it was partially successful, but not, it, it didn't cover, you know, we still got 52,000 properties where we don't know who the owner is. And it didn't cover trust. So if you're Abramovich, you just put the property into a trust in your children's name, and nobody would know who really was the beneficial owner, you, at the end of it. 
Um, so, and the second bill is now before Parliament. It's in the House of Lords. So my group uh, works really hard to build cross-party consensus on the reforms in that to try and ensure that we um, strengthen the bill and therefore strengthen the fight. So we're looking, we're, I guess, both priority number one is to get this failure to prevent a fed sin that I talked to you about, where uh, accountants and lawyers who fail to prevent money laundering and fraud would be subject to a criminal, uh, criminal prosecution. And the other thing is to get the funding better for enforcement. So we're working really hard on that. And what we do, a lot of lobbying, so I'm spending a lot of time talking to members of the House of Lords at the moment, because if we can get them to agree amendments, it makes it difficult for the government to overturn them in the House of Commons, uh, where they've got a clearer majority. Uh, and we try and draw attention to the problem, which is another thing we do. Uh, so, you know, a lot of uh, uh, we've got staff who help, you know, promote it in the media social media, all that sort of stuff. Um, and we're trying to think ahead as to what's the next stage after this bill, if we get it really um, mended. And one of the issues we're looking at, which is quite an interesting one, is again, going to Ukraine and the Russians. We've frozen something like 300 billion pounds worth of Russian assets that we know about in the UK. But you freeze them, you can't seize them, and we want to look at ways in which you could seize that money and then repurpose it to help with the reconstruction of Ukraine. And that's a very difficult public policy area, but it's one which we're, we're sort of beginning to focus our minds on. Okay, okay, okay. awesome. Um, okay, two, two more questions here then. Um, do you think the government could or even should go after properties bought by foreign nationals who can't explain um, the true origins of their funds used to purchase these? Or do you think that's too radical? Uh, no, no I, I didn't think so. <laughs> no, I think they definitely should. We should know who owns it and whether, where the money came from. Definitely. And that's what the property register was supposed to supposed to do. It was supposed to tell you who owned it. And it just said they've written it so badly that there the, are just too many loopholes. Okay. Um, and is your group considering the role that uh, generative AI technology is increasingly playing in financial fraud? Yeah. Great question. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. uh, and the answer is not enough, and we should be doing more. Mm. So come and help us. We can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's all. laughs> yeah no, I, we should I'm, do more. That's mm. one of the ways for uh, directions of travel. Yeah, like I guess it's something that society is just starting to get to grips with and yeah it'd be the same with with, with everywhere really yeah. yeah okay well um if there aren't any more questions i think we will end things there margaret thank you very much for okay all the very best really appreciate it um, good luck to all your students <laughs>